I, uh, I didn't know Gene was a rapper. Schmalar out. <laughs> if only, if only. Oh, man. I'm sure you have the chops for it, Gene, but you just, well, never mind, never mind. The, uh, the one, uh, if you will, item of uh, church life that just got slipped to me uh, a moment ago uh, is this little matter. It's Alex and Janet Seton's uh, 49th wedding anniversary today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, Alex robbed the cradle, I know. But, but that, that's, that's really nice. Uh, when you, I, if, we'll come by and say uh, congratulations to Alex in person. That's uh, really nice that uh, we're able to uh, acknowledge that today. Uh, next year we'll acknowledge it, the big 5-0. And uh, let's just all determine to have a party next year, okay? All right, okay. Well, today is Armistice Day, and uh, you know the history of that. Uh, we uh, remember those who've fallen in battle. We remember because the freedoms we enjoy are due in some part to those who made a great sacrifice at some time in the past. That's why we wear poppies and uh, remember that, uh, well, not long ago, I guess it would be uh, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, uh, World War I ceased officially. And next year it'll be the 100th anniversary of that war that was supposed to end all wars. And we, of course, observed two minutes of silence, one minute to remember those who fell, another to remember those who suffered and survived, the families. And, of course, it is an ongoing tragedy that we send uh, young men off to war. And uh, when they return, more often than not, they're damaged and sometimes broken and unable to cope with the realities when I was very young and I went to, quote, Bible college, as we would say, or uh, to what became Ambassador University, uh, I one day asked uh, one of my roommates uh, in a rather naive way, uh, what made you decide to come to God's college? And his response was low, dra uh, low draft number. And I didn't understand that growing up in England. I, I read Newsweek and Time magazine and knew there was a war in Asia, but I didn't relate to it in any way at all because Britain wasn't really involved. And uh, when I uh, ended up in California and I found I was surrounded by young men and, who were my age, and uh, many of them had low draft numbers, which meant they went to school because you could get a deferment. And, of course, those who weren't going to school, those who were perhaps less academically gifted, those who were uh, not as well off, perhaps came from areas that were more impoverished, uh, they were easier to draft. And so the ones who went to war, sent off by those who were just a little bit better off. And uh, back then it was an unpopular war. And, of course, it ended in uh, uh, defeat. Really, we can, can't call it any, anything else. And uh, before even it got going, uh, just recently, archives were uh, uh, given out uh, under the, you know, the expiration of the official secret acts or whatever. And Lyndon Johnson was recorded uh, as uh, saying on tape, uh, this is a nightmare and I don't see any way we can win. And of course, he had to go after that and still commit half a million troops or so, and preside over a war that not only made him very unpopular, but lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars and cost trillions of dollars. And so uh, there's very little glorious about war, uh, but we have mixed emotions because uh, we know that sometimes if it were not for those who had gone to war, we would not have the freedom that we enjoy. Of course, today, as we uh, remember the, uh, the poppy and we remember the poem, we remember Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, who is a, a Canadian uh, who himself, from Guelph, Ontario, uh, served as a, a medical officer and wrote the very famous poem, and I'll, re I'll bring it up for you in a moment, but he wrote it sitting on the back of an ambulance. Uh, the day after he had buried his best 
He was looking across the cemetery at the, uh, the grave where his best friend now rested. He'd been buried the night before in darkness for fear of attracting any enemy attention. And now he sat during the day hearing the guns blasting in the not very distant uh, uh, area where uh, he was rescuing literally people who had been hurt. And uh, he looked at the poppies that were flourishing on the freshly disturbed soil of graves. And he wrote the very famous poem. Uh, the uh, story is told of a, uh, a soldier who was delivering mail who stood for a few moments waiting for him uh, to turn and pay attention. And uh, he scratched off the last lines of the poem and then he handed it to the soldier and, ha and, and in exchange took his mail. And the soldier read it and said it described perfectly the scene that they were observing. A graveyard that was full of freshly disturbed soil and on which poppies grew. And of course, uh, some months later, he himself died as a result of uh, damage he experienced during the stress and the strain of the First World War. We read the, uh, the poem traditionally at this time, and I can uh, show it to you, the first stanza. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. That mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. And so speaking from the perspective of the dead, uh, it is as if we could say, after sacrifice, what has changed? After all the bloodshed and the turmoil, what has changed? The birds fly above the guns as we wish that we could. Uh, and uh, we've given our lives, and uh, as the prophet says, we ourselves are like the flowers of the field, and we've come and we've gone, and uh, who will remember us but poppies uh, will flourish on the disturbed soil where we have been buried in the second stanza, the, the dead speak. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved, and were loved. Now we lie in Flanders fields. Which again poses the question, uh, for all the love, emotion, and the participation in life, now that's passed, it's taken from us. Again, a very sad reflection and as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, we always hear at election times, we must do more for veterans, we must do more for, especially in the United States where you have a generation that uh, were impoverished as a result of the war, damaged, hurt, uh, post-traumatic stress being very real syndrome, a very real hurt and uh, requiring sometimes a, life li a lifetime of uh, attention. And uh, oftentimes those we see on the streets uh, are those who have actually served in times past. Now, the third stanza in particular uh, that, that, that McRae wrote is sometimes considered a, somewhat of a call for war uh, because he writes, take up your quarrel, take up our quarrel, with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high if we break faith, if you break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now, that was used as a recruiting poster and a rallying cry to uh, inspire young men and young women to sacrifice, to step up at a time of need. And that is why it's been criticized. I don't think McRae sat there and thought we need to get more people uh, to come to the front and suffer like the ones here and now. I don't think that was on his mind at the time. But it does speak to the fact that the uh, sacrifice calls for a response from those who follow. Uh, that uh, their sacrifice uh, not be in vain and hence the cliche perhaps we use, lest we forget. I don't want to in any way trivialize uh, this, this poem, but uh, uh, at a time when uh, Quebecois uh, felt very uh, stressed, and of course uh, French was often forbidden, um, uh, the most uh, storied franchise in NHL history, 
which we would, uh, I think, all agree was uh, Montreal Canadien. Uh, they they remembered that they were a symbol of uh, Quebec identity uh, of. Uh, wrong way perhaps Quebec nationalism but they were uh, a symbol of culture and uh, language and uh, memories and uh, so they actually put that up in the Montreal Canadiens locker room as an inspiration to generations that would follow so this has been co-opted in different places you can see uh, where uh, generation after generation of especially uh, French players would sit beneath that poem uh, and faces of those who had gone before them and it was a way of saying hey fellas uh, you know you happen to be here because those who've gone before you have represented the pride of Quebecois and we expect you to step up and do the same uh, hasn't made a whole lot of difference perhaps over the years to the number of Stanley Cups uh, but uh, on the other hand uh, it to be used as an inspiration uh, to others to remind them, look, others have gone before you and given up more than you have so that you can have uh, perhaps the uh, much more uh, uh, enriched life uh, of a professional athlete that you have now. Now, the, for a Christian, the, uh, the question it always uh, presents is, is war ever justified? Is it justified? As I said, when I went to school, uh, there were those around who were conscientious objectors, and under no circumstances would they bear arms or even serve in the medical corps. And uh, this was a tension that they felt. And so they either went to school, or if they couldn't qualify for study, uh, there was the, the four, uh, 4D program, I think it was, or four, not 4 4D, and uh, that gave you uh, the opportunity to work for two years at minimum wage. Uh, and so here were uh, young men uh, who were uh, trying to avoid that. And yet, uh, God gives to mankind the responsibility to manage justice. Um, we all would expect a murderer, let's say, to be arrested. If somebody were to assault us in any way, we would immediately demand that a police force show up, uh, preferably armed, and uh, defend us uh, or pursue the person who had hurt us. And we also know that, uh, at the very least, Paul in uh, Romans uh, teaches that we are ourselves are to submit to the civil authorities. Now, this gets uh, You can think, let's say... Uh, of uh, Germany in 1937, 38, 39, where uh, an evil political party had uh, uh, come to power, been elected uh, on false promise, but then gradually the underbelly was revealed and uh, hatred was rampant and uh, there were some very uh, interesting personalities, uh, I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, uh, uh, and, and many others. Uh, some years ago, I went to the very first concentration camp that was established. It was the prototype for others in uh, Sachsenhausen, north of Berlin. And I walked through the jail cells where Seventh-day Adventists and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses had been imprisoned. Now, there were others, political prisoners. Bonhoeffer was there as well. And he found himself uh, in a struggle with the, uh, the leadership of the Nazi party who insisted that as a Lutheran minister, he should understand that uh, Paul teaches the uh, submission to the state. Uh, obey the, uh, those who have the rule over you. Obey the authorities. They bear not the sword in vain, he puts it. In other words, if you go against the established government of the day, uh, you're going to have problems and difficulties. That's not your role as a Christian. And of course, Bonhoeffer knew that there was evil emerging and it was becoming worse and worse and worse. Uh, and uh, he was engaged on a number of occasions by the Gestapo in debates as to whether or not uh, he was being supportive enough of the Nazi regime. He was deemed, uh, he, he also was, uh, I think, trying to pass secrets to the Allies. He was trying to work things through, and he, he wrote on the subject of uh, justice, on the subject of the Christian in the world of that day. Eventually, of course, he was arrested and deemed uh, somewhat of an enemy of the state, but he couldn't be executed because there were a lot of Lutheran soldiers uh, who were uh, carrying the rifle. 
And so uh, it was, I believe, towards the end of the war that he was finally executed. But this tension and difficulty that exists in the Christian soul is not clear-cut. There are those who would serve, and those who would serve as uh, medics, let's say, and uh, in support roles to relieve suffering. Uh, this past year, there was a very uh, interesting made out of one man's experience as a medic, uh, one man who offered his services but refused to carry a rifle. It was a very inspiring story, and uh, he uh, did a great deal of good to relieve suffering, and uh, he's still alive, or was still alive when the movie was made. Uh, I, I'm very, uh, I guess, uh, proud of the fact that Canadian soldiers uh, serve as peacekeepers. They put themselves in harm's way between warring factions and try to stabilize areas in that way. I think that says well for Canada. I know I uh, talked to a, an eminent diplomat from a European country uh, a few years ago, and I asked him his opinion of uh, Canada. And he said we have in very high esteem uh, and with great respect. Uh, because of the role that we play in the world. We have always, as Canadians, had somewhat of a, uh, a, a peacekeeping role. And when, of course, Canadians went to Europe in the Second World War, it was to bring uh, liberty and freedom. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before we observed a moment of silence, um, at least one lady had told me as a girl in Holland how she felt about seeing Canadian soldiers walk down the streets in her town, in her village and how grateful she was to this very day for the fact that she had been rescued, that her country had been rescued. And so here we have this struggle in our own minds to wonder, would, would I serve under those circumstances? Uh, what would I do? Is this war? Uh, Jesus, when he was uh, confronted by Pilate, and of course this becomes a proof text then, um, uh, and, and there's a discussion between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, uh, and uh, Pontius Pilate is kind of trying to help him to get off the hook. And Jesus, of course, is offering himself as the sacrifice of humani for humanity, and uh, Pilate doesn't understand that. But in this exchange, Jesus answering his question, are you a king, and uh, you know, why, are you, why is this happening to you, and why are you bringing it to my door, and why all this trouble? Jesus speaks to Pilate in this way in John 18 and verse 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my sight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. And so really in this context, he's not saying, I forbid all Christians ever from uh, resisting evil or going to war, but he is saying, you know, right now, uh, number one, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, my purpose is different. Uh, if it were of this world, my servants would fight. And so uh, that's a bit of an out of context thing to take and say, well, under no circumstances should a Christian ever serve. Uh, as I said a while ago, Paul, when he points out that we are to submit to the authorities as Christians, um, it is, uh, it is an interesting world uh, that uh, we inherit. And uh, when God created and explained to us in Genesis the sort of world that existed before Noah's time, you even have stories of God intervening, if you will, and dictating what is justice. And saying, I don't want Cain, even though he's a murderer, executed. I want him to live for whatever God's purposes were. We won't go there. But after uh, the flood, and after Noah reestablishes civilization in quotes on this earth, uh, you read this in Genesis 9 and verse 5. Surely your blood of your lives will I, will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of every man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. In other words, from now on, to live together, and you're going to have to figure out what is justice. You're going to have to have, quote, civilization. You're going to have to lay down laws. You're going to have to have courts. 
juries, police forces, things like that, and you are going to sometimes have to execute capital punishments. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. That's an interesting thing. You know, you are going to take judgment into your own hands. Uh, when I am the ruler of the world, there will be justice, and I am the God of love, and I will administer it. But now, in this civilization, which we date all the way back to, if you will, uh, Noah and his family, um, from now on, you're going to have to figure that out, and you're going to have to take responsibility. And so when we consider, as I said, with uh, the, the conflict that someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, would go through, and uh, the uh, challenge that he would have as a Lutheran minister, and of course he had been quiet for a while. As he said, you know, they came for the communists, I didn't say anything. Uh, they came for the, uh, the Jews, I didn't say a lot. They uh, came for the, uh, uh, those who were um, physically challenged, mentally challenged. You know, there were a lot of uh, eugenics that were going on uh, and uh, uh, racial cleansing that was going on in the mid to late 30s. And by the time they got around to Christians, he said, by the time they came for me, there was nobody left to speak up. And by then, I was in conflict. I was caught. And when I did decide to try and speak up, well, it was too late. And so uh, we look back on a Christian history of this struggle, all the way back to Augustine, who tried to explain that uh, there shouldn't be such a thing as a just war. I think Thomas Aquinas tried to refine that as well and said, you know, if you are uh, the victim of aggression, then finally it is appropriate in the same way as a citizen is the victim of oppression, you have to stand up. You have to stand up for your borders. You have to stand up for your people. You have to stand up and do something. And of course, this creates conflict in our soul. Uh, it creates trouble and difficulty. We try to figure out where do you draw the lines. Do we trust the politicians who stand up and say, well, I will speak for you and I'll organize for you so you step up and you carry the rifle, uh, well, that, that's difficult. Uh, but there were numerous discussions as to a theory of a just war. And of course that theory included, well, first of all, you have to negotiate. You have to discuss. You have to try to resolve conflicts and difficulties. Uh, you have to try to bring peace. And if that breaks down, then you have to sort of determine whether or not you're the right party to become involved. Should you be standing between other parties? Should you make alliances? And finally, if it's, uh, if it's your border that's being transgressed, well then, uh, as Augustine and uh, Thomas Aquinas, you as a Christian should do something. Now there are Christians that divert from that opinion. You know, the uh, Quaker faith uh, says under no circumstances, but you should serve then as a medic or a support or one to relieve suffering. And others have very similar views. Not everybody who's a Christian says, well, I'm just gonna be a conscientious objector. Uh, although even my peers who were conscientious objectors didn't have an easy time of it. I, I look back and if you try to say, well, was there ever a just war? Uh, perhaps the, the one that we could justify would be the Second World War. And uh, I think of that because my dad was in that. And uh, he, uh, as a young man, was drafted. And uh, he didn't run off to war. Uh, the other uh, talked about it. Uh, we were discussing it uh, the other, other day when I was in England. And uh, he said uh, when he went uh, to, 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 to answer the call, his father and his brother who was involved in uh, a vital industry, uh, uh, manufacturing parts, so they didn't draft him, but the two of them took my dad uh, to, uh, to offer himself at the intake, and uh, you know, one on either side, because he was not uh, bouncing up and down with enthusiasm to go to war. And uh, he, uh, he went to war uh, during the, 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 the uh, I will say, the, the easier time towards the end. And uh, he, he told me when I was uh, younger, because, you know, he 
is with me, but he didn't talk about it very much. Um, and he told, I think, more to my little brother uh, in later years. But uh, at the end of the war, he found himself in Germany on the front lines, and they'd gone through a series of experiences, usually accepting the capitulation, the surrender. And so there were numerous times when uh, his unit accepted the surrender uh, of uh, some very high-ranking uh, uh, opponents. And at the end of the war, he found himself in Germany. Uh, and they were camped in a field, and they knew that uh, ceasefire was coming. It was going to be officially ended. And uh, he said uh, when it was finally came over the, uh, the, the radio, uh, they let an hour or so go by, and then they walked out from the field into uh, a lane, and they looked down to a farmhouse. And there were uh, farmers, German farmers, who stepped out into the, to the roadway as well and beckoned them down in a very excited way, and celebrated with them. They found schnapps that they'd probably been hiding for a long time, and uh, poured uh, several rounds of drinks and celebrated that uh, finally peace had returned to their land, and normacy had returned to their land. And then uh, uh, my dad's unit was immediately uh, told that you have to retrain uh, for the uh, war in the Far East, uh, and they were going to the Japanese theater of war. Now that uh, didn't uh, transpire, but he was had some sickness at the time, so he was pulled out of his unit, and by the time he recovered, uh, he, uh, was, you know, he was no longer sent back to that unit, and he was uh, reassigned to what was called the Graves Registration Unit. A couple of years uh, after the war in Italy, uh, literally uh, finding those who had fallen in war, and uh, as part of what he called the Graves Unit. And first of all, they were billeted in Rome, and uh, at least according to my brother, I didn't know this until he told me, but uh, he actually was billeted in Mussolini's mansion, and uh, he and his unit were stayed in Mussolini's home. And uh, those were obviously, after the war, much, much better times. But my dad had uh, very uh, fond memories of spending this several years, and he, he learned Italian, ate a lot of spaghetti, and uh, I think always lamented uh, after he came home that my mother did not know how to make spaghetti sauce. Uh, and so when I grew up, if we had spaghetti, you had ketchup and uh, some cheese on it. And none of you ladies would ever invite me to your home and say, would you like spaghetti with ketchup on? You just wouldn't do it. Um, I'd be polite and eat it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was decades later uh, that uh, uh, he came and stayed in my home after he retired and he had real spaghetti sauce but I guess he enjoyed that in Italy a great deal but in the midst of poverty and all of the disruption uh, he spent a uh, better part of two years uh, digging up the fallen where they've been buried in battle and especially he spent a great deal of time around um, a place called Monte Cassino where there was a huge battle and uh, a few years ago now, I, I had an opportunity to go back there or there for the first time. Uh, my dad always wanted to go back, and he never, ever could get it together, uh, which is a real tragedy when you, because his grandkids will fly there to go skiing uh, for a weekend, or they'll fly somewhere in Europe to Barcelona for a bachelor party. Because with EasyJet, it's you know, $75 to take a flight a relatively short distance in Europe. But uh, I got to go to Monte Cassino, and I went to uh, one of the graveyards that uh, I believe he uh, uh, worked with and for. And uh, I, I have a picture here uh, of uh, one of the uh, major graveyards. I went to this one. It was very touching, in fact, uh, to walk in and see the first gravestone I saw said simply, to an unknown Canadian soldier. And then you go to the next one, and it says simply, uh, an inscription that was left, a plaque that somebody had carved that said something like Joe, you know, friend I ever had, some veteran who had gone back, you know, decades later and just placed it at his, at his friend's grave. You look at those gravestones. Uh, I spent several days in Naples before that, and with all due respect to Italy and uh, the uh, storage city of Naples, it was an absolute dump. I'll just say that. I said to somebody, you know, look at the garbage around this place. They said, you should have been here three months ago when we had a garbage strike. Oi, how could it be worse than this? 
and I sat on the roof uh, of the hotel and could look down to where the cruise ships were coming in and look over there to uh, uh, Mount Vesuvius and uh, look at all the crappy buildings that surrounded this hotel that had been somewhat restored. And I thought, well, Italy is. And uh, then I got out of the, uh, one day I was able to get out and drive north past Capua, you know, famous for uh, Spartacus and his rebellion, and go up to Monte Cassino and see the very famous uh, uh, monastery up on the hill. And it was beautiful, and it was pristine, and then I began to see why people would fall in love with Italy. And when I got to this graveyard, I was just overwhelmed by the, the cleanliness and the care with which somebody cared for the memory of all those fallen Canadians. I don't know how much my father was involved with digging up Canadian soldiers who'd fallen, but I know that he worked in that area and he contributed. Here we have uh, memories of uh, those who were cut off in their youth, cut off in their prime. And we remember them, uh, hopefully, uh, that their efforts contributed not to more strife, but in the spirit of uh, chapter 5 and verse 9 of Matthew, and in which Jesus simply said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God which is why I have uh, respect and affection for Canadian soldiers uh, who wear the blue beret of the United Nations and try to bring peace and stability to some areas that tragically uh, cannot find it. But of course, more to the point, I realize that those who've gone before do not require of me a, uh, a sort of a where I join the military, but what they require is the same as Jesus Christ requires, which is the spirit of the peacemaker uh, be uh, the way in which I live, in which I relate to other people and try to be supportive and cooperative and understand it's my responsibility not to bring sort of flame to crisis, but to bring a little calm, a little peace, hopefully a little insight and reflection. I. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for trying to illustrate this Christian responsibility in daily life uh, with a story. It's kind of a funny story, but Jim Moss handed it to me uh, before church, and I thought, uh, I don't know if this is appropriate to uh, include in the sermon, but if it's not, I'll blame Jim. But uh, it speaks to the Christian responsibility. Um, but it, it speaks of, an, uh, of this particular scenario. There's very much a day-to-day -day scenario that requires of us the Christian response in the spirit of peacefulness, which is, uh, has been made possible by those we remember today. It speaks of an honest man who was being tailgated by a stressed-out woman on a busy boulevard, and suddenly the light turned yellow just in front of him. He did the right thing, stopping at the crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman hit the roof and the horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection with him. As she was still in mid-rant, any of you women relate to this? No, no. As she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer, the officer ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted to the booket desk where the arresting officer was waiting with his personal, her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping your finger to the guy in front of you, and cussing a blue streak at him. I noticed the Choose Life license plate holder. The what would Jesus do bumper sticker, the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. Naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> you know, uh, it begs the question, have we stolen the name of Jesus? Uh, have we stolen the idea of Christianity, but not necessarily put as much effort into living it. Because just as those who have gone before us, it's just my dad went before 
me, and uh, he had a very, very, very small part at the end of a very difficult war, which brought freedom and liberty to some of your family members brought freedom and liberty. Perhaps some of your family members fled from the east towards the west because they knew the soldiers liberating the west were going to treat them fairly and humanely and kindly as opposed to the soldiers who liberated the east. And uh, that is well documented, and I know uh, some of us have friends who were very aware of that. And some of us perhaps were girls and boys back in that time in the late, the, uh, late part of the war and remember liberation. But in the same way, there were those who my father went before me in the Christian faith. And it was frankly more difficult for him uh, because he took upon himself certain things he didn't necessarily have to take on. But he did in a good conscience for his Christian faith. And he also took on uh, during a more difficult time the responsibility of uh, carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. And he gave me that tradition as well. And that's the one I have to be proud of, and that's the hat we'll continue with. And so as I think of the freedom I enjoy, on the one hand, I also think of the grace I enjoy as a result of his introducing me to faith and to having a confidence in the future in Jesus Christ. Uh, Steve Smith, uh, a, a Christian singer, uh, recorded a song many years ago that reflected the spirit of remembrance. But in this particular case, it was the spirit of Christian remembrance. And it always uh, came back to me. In fact, one of my more pleasant memories of my youngest kid was actually joining a group and singing that song about 25 years ago and uh, others who sang it. And it uh, always stayed with me. Just as uh, the uh, poem of Flanders Field, this, this song with me, and I'll just share the chorus with you, uh, which is a call of remembrance for a Christian. Uh, the chorus simply read, Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. May all who come behind us, find us faithful. McCray asked that a generation take the torch that was being handed on by those who sacrificed. And it's a very difficult thing to rationalize at times and to ask ourselves, are we, you know, just as the Montreal Canadians said, well, we will pick up the heritage of our culture and try to support that and champion that. And then there were those who said, well, of McRae's poem, well, is it a right thing to inspire people to pick up uh, the culture of warring against the foe? And so these things are, you know, one is maybe to us trivial, the other is to us complicated, but there's one thing very, very clear on a day of remembrance. There are those who've gone before us in the faith who've made it possible for us to understand and follow in the same faith to have the same confidence in Jesus Christ, uh, to live a life that still puts upon us the responsibility of laying out for the next generation through our example, through our light, through our interaction, through our ability perhaps to be the sort of women who doesn't, woman who doesn't freak out and get arrested because there's a thought that you must have hijacked the name of Jesus to be sincere acting that way that I in, in, indeed uh, must have hijacked his, his identity for my own purposes rather than living, and as he asked, carrying not a torch, but a cross, and following in his footsteps and the footsteps of those who went before us. It's a much more serious matter than my dad. I'm, I, I respect and I'm proud of the fact that he served to bring liberation and freedom at a very difficult time. Uh, but I'm far more proud of the fact that he uh, set an example that every now and then comes back to haunt me, and I think of the way he conducted himself and was able to pass on that faith to his children and his grandchildren. And that's the responsibility on a Remembrance Day that really we ought to reflect upon. Just as we honor those who went before us to give freedom, let's honor those who went before us to give faith and following in their footsteps as they followed in the footsteps of Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let, let's close with prayer.
Our Father in heaven today, as we reflect on those who've given a sacrifice and the freedom that we enjoy and rightly take for granted. We take it for granted because the price has been paid and we live in a free country. And even though we may have philosophical and political differences, we still enjoy a tremendous way of life because we are Canadians. We also thank you that there are those who've gone before us who seeded the understanding and the inspiration to know you into our lives. And we ask that uh, even as we continue to walk in the footsteps that Jesus set before us, we also inspire others that follow. That our example can back, come back to be, if you will, a poppy on their memories, a flower on their recollections, as we live a life that brings to them uh, a hope and an inspiration that they would want to live the same life as well. So today we thank you on this Remembrance Day, but especially we take to heart the responsibility as the light of the world to leave behind us an example that is an inspiration to others, just as you, as Holy Spirit, lead and guide and inspire us. So we thank you for today. We thank you for the remembrance in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.